Good afternoon or good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Michael Lang. I'm Vice Rector for Research and Human Resources here at VU, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome all of you here. Uh, I want to thank you and also to congratulate you uh, that you have decided to spend uh, the evening here uh, with us, uh, and in particular uh, to spend uh, the evening on uh, this uh, very uh, important uh, topic. Well, as we all know, anti-Semitism has grown and expanded across Europe in general and in Austria, unfortunately, in particular over the last uh, decades. There was a, a research, a study published by the Austrian Parliament just a few uh, weeks ago, uh, which revealed, uh, among other things, uh, that there is widespread uh, support for conspiracy theories involving global Jewish networks negatively influencing business, politics, and the media. And uh, probably uh, the pandemic uh, has uh, contributed uh, uh, to uh, what uh, we uh, experience uh, now. Well, uh, from an, an academic point of view, uh, much of the research on anti-Semitism is historical in nature, uh, which is understandable, given to quote the Stockholm Declaration of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IHRA, with humanity still scared by anti-Semitism and xenophobia, the international community shares a solemn responsibility to combat those evils. And uh, of course, we as a university, we as a responsible university, uh, we are also uh, committed, and uh, as you uh, might know, uh, VU has uh, also officially adopted uh, IHRA, uh, the working definition of anti-Semitism, uh, which states that anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred uh, toward uh, Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property, uh, toward Jewish uh, community institutions and religious uh, facilities. Uh, VU is uh, active in this, uh, in this area and uh, we are uh, proud uh, that uh, we are the only business school, uh, not only in this country but uh, also in Europe and beyond, uh, which uh, hosts an interdisciplinary initiative focusing on anti-Semitism in uh, business and in economics. And uh, this initiative is also responsible uh, for organizing uh, tonight's event. Uh, so I would uh, like uh, to thank uh, my uh, colleagues, uh, in particular Professor Altman, Professor Meyerhofer, Professor Müller Kamen uh, and uh, their uh, colleagues. And I would also like uh, to thank uh, the uh, management department of this university because uh, today's event is also uh, part of uh, the series VU Matters and uh, there is always uh, another uh, department uh, which is responsible uh, for the content of uh, uh, this uh, uh, event and uh, I'm very happy uh, that uh, the Department of Management has uh, decided uh, to focus on uh, this uh, very important issue. Yeah, so I'm very m uh, much looking forward uh, to uh, what we are going uh, to hear uh, now, to the lecture and uh, the discussion afterwards, and I would like to hand over uh, to uh, Professor Wolfgang Meyerhofer, who will introduce uh, uh, those who are uh, delivering uh, lectures and uh, participating in the panel discussion afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Also, a very warm welcome uh, from my end on uh, behalf of uh, Michael Miller Carmen and uh, the whole department. Some of the colleagues are here, uh, we who uh, are kind of responsible for this uh, view matters. Uh, uh, today we're gonna follow a very, I would say, traditional format. We'll have uh, with a not so traditional content, of course, uh, and with very unique people. But the format itself uh, will be not extraordinary. We're going to have uh, 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 an outstanding, I'm sure, uh, uh, keynote talk uh, uh, by uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Ignatiev. Uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit about him uh, afterwards when presenting uh, the members of the panel. 
uh, and we'll have uh, a panel sitting over there, uh, first, uh, maybe second round of panel discussions, and then we open up the floor to you. You can ha ask the questions. We are looking forward to that. And there will be, as usual, uh, some succinct uh, remarks at the end where everything is kind of uh, put on the spot uh, again uh, to, uh, for a takeaway and uh, for some maybe uh, a major reason to attend uh, if you look uh, uh, and turn around uh, it's empty now but it will be not empty uh, uh, I don't know 60 minutes from now uh, in terms of food and drink uh, uh, for those uh, who are uh, kind of looking forward to that only, maybe, I don't know. Uh, uh, thanks very much uh, to our panelists who uh, so uh, graciously and positively reacted uh, to our invitation. Helga Imbacher is uh, with us. Uh, she is uh, coming from the University of Salzburg, is there a professor of contemporary history. Her uh, main fields of research uh, are uh, national uh, socialism, uh, Jewish history, migration, Israel and anti-Semitism. Uh, she has widely published, uh, has a number of uh, visiting uh, professorships, uh, among others, uh, in Haifa, uh, in Minneapolis, in Pennsylvania. Uh, thanks uh, for being uh, with us. Uh, she's uh, an outstanding expert in the area, and we are very glad uh, to have you with us. Uh, Dr. Musikant uh, is a widely known figure here in Austria and in Europe. Uh, thanks very much for accepting uh, this uh, invitation. He's the president of the European Jewish Congress and uh, the vice president of the World Jewish Congress. Uh, 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 for those of you who have been in Austria or following the Austrian developments for a number of years, uh, he's very, very well known uh, since uh, uh, at least uh, the 70s with a number of uh, campaigns uh, going on. Uh, uh, those of you like myself whose hair are not uh, dark anymore uh, will remember the Waldheim times, uh, etc., where he played an outstanding and very remarkable uh, uh, role. Uh, he uh, 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 kind of uh, built and founded also Simon Wiesenthal Institute, uh, a kind of Austrian institution, uh, and uh, was receiving an, uh, a number of the highest uh, uh, Austrian and uh, Viennese rewards. Uh, so thanks for uh, kind of uh, being with us. And finally, uh, 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 Michael Ignatieff, uh, uh, Canadian-born writer, historian, uh, former politician in Canada, leading the Liberal Party in the Parliament. Uh, he's a professor of history uh, and with the European, uh, Central European University. Uh, many of you will know uh, the kind of... Uh, I was tempted to say decided to leave uh, Budapest, not sure whether that's the correct word. In the end, uh, they decided, and I think that's correct, uh, to go uh, to Vienna. Uh, and um, he has, uh, uh, is the author of uh, uh, 18 books, if I got that correctly. Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, many more things uh, to say. I think uh, his latest book deserves uh, an explicit uh, mentioning uh, Consolation, uh, finding solace in dark times. Uh, not sure whether that's the best entry uh, for uh, for this evening, but uh, I think it's a it's an excellent theme. And then, without further ado, uh, thanks for joining, and the floor is yours, Michael. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for this generous. In, uh, introduction. Thanks to VU. I hope the vice rector will convey my gratitude to whole university for the way this institution supported us when a homeless waif showed up on your doorstep f three years ago, having been thrown out of Budapest. Um, Edeltraud, Hannah Pieger, and her team were extraordinarily welcoming and helping to us, and I'm extremely grateful to you for that. Uh, okay, let's get down and do some work. I, I'm looking forward to a discussion with all of you. I'm now going to press a button in the hope that my slides will appear. They do. Fabulous. Um, I want to put emphasis on the word today in my presentation. Um, 
there is a very great deal that can be said about anti-Semitism going back a very long way, but I, my, my purpose here is to help us focus on what is specific about contemporary anti-Semitism. I should say I have no qualifications in this other than being a historian of contemporary Europe. Um, other people in this room will know more than I, and so I'm anxious to learn from you. But my focus is on what is specific about anti-Semitism uh, today, and I will lay out a, um, a road map. As some of you know, uh, anti-Semitism was called the socialism of fools. That is, it's a kind of anti-capitalism uh, that... Uh, uh, takes anti-capitalist themes and turns them against the Jews. Anti-Semitism is also a kind of nationalism that takes nationalist themes about the identity of the nation and turns it against, anti, uh, against the Jews. It is also has a strong religious component um, and uh, takes Christian and other themes and turns it against the Jews. So I've taken the phrase, the socialism of fools, and then applied it to two other aspects of uh, anti-Semitism that I think we need to think about. And then I want to move uh, quickly to what seems to be constitutive of, of contemporary anti-Semitism, which is the ways in which anti-Semitism is now expressed even when there are no Jews around. Uh, anti-Semitism without Jews is a very puzzling phenomenon and tells you something about the psychological dynamics of anti-Semitism that we need to understand. And I also want to talk about anti-Semitism without anti-Semites. That is, the ways in which anti-Semitic beliefs and attitudes, forms of casual cruelty, taken for granted attitudes, um, are accompanied by a a pattern in which no one will say publicly that they are an anti-Semite. Um, so you have this odd phenomenon of people expressing anti-Semitic views but denying that they're anti-Semites. So that's what I mean by anti-Semitism without anti-Semites. And I then want to focus on what seems to me the crucial issue um, about contemporary anti-Semitism, which is at the moment, at least in Europe, to my knowledge, and I'm happy to stand corrected, there is no political party with explicit anti-Semitic messaging or programming in their party platforms. Peter Pulitzer, the great historian of 19th century um, uh, anti-Semitism in Austria and Germany, made the point that anti-Semitism becomes lethal, lethally dangerous, when it finds official political expression. So I want to think about how it is that... Um, and raise the question whether uh, anti-Semitism uh, will find an explicit political expression in our time or in Europe. Uh, so that's the menu, folks, and let me then very quickly go through some of these typologies. By socialism of fools, I mean attitudes towards Jews that take are enfolded within um, a, critic, a critique of capitalism, a critique of capitalism that focuses on its inequality, on its injustice. This is carried from the left. It is often enfolded in a conspiracy theory in which what drives capitalism is a small, hidden, concealed network of Jews who are driving the system towards ever greater inequality, ever greater cruelty, ever greater injustice. It is also, in contemporary form, closely connected with hostility to Israel. So there is an anti-Zionist uh, tendency in the European left, particularly strongly evident recently in Britain. Um, and uh, the British Labour Party had to go through a, an extraordinarily difficult and painful process of routing out uh, anti-Zionist um, uh, expressions and attitudes uh, from the Labour Party in Britain. Uh, and 
if they don't do that, they will never get a Jewish vote again. And the Jewish vote has been a very strong supporter of um, uh, the Labour Party in um, post-war Britain. By nationalism of fools, I mean a, a, an anti-Semitism that picks up um, hostility to migrants, that picks up hostility to cosmopolitanism, that picks up hostility to pluralism, um, picks up hostility to the entire social experiment that Europe and North America have been undertaking since the 1960s, namely um, the opening of our frontiers to immigration from a range of countries. This is seen as a threat to a nation um, and <clears throat> often the nationalism of fools takes the form in Hungary, for example, of hostility to migrants, hostility to foreigners, hostility to pluralism, hostility to cosmopolitanism. But in the case of Viktor Orban, identifying a prominent Jew, George Soros, as being the mastermind of the flooding of Hungary by uh, foreigners. So there's a ways in which um, anti-Semitism folds into um, anti-migrant, anti-cosmopolitan, and anti-pluralist attitudes towards um, uh, the societies we happen to live in. Finally, the religion of fools, um, the relationship between uh, Christianity and uh, Judaism is incredibly complicated. There are many very soundly based arguments going back prior to the Christian era, arguing that there was hostility to Jews before the Christian era, so that the association between anti-Semitism and um, Christianity is in fact deeply problematic. Um, I will refer later in this lecture to Yehuda Bauer, the great historian of European uh, anti-Semitism, now an emeritus professor at uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, but he makes the point that um, Jews have always awakened um, hostility um, because they will not worship the gods of the majority. They will not bow down to the gods of ordered that they are ordered to worship by their rulers, uh, and they maintain separate customs. This predates uh, Christianity, but there's simply no doubt that um, the Christian religion has an entirely problematic relationship to its, the other fact about Christianity, which is that Christianity is based on the rock of the Hebrew Bible. Um, I've been looking very cl closely at the Apostle Paul and one of the things that's fascinating when you read Paul's epistles again, this was a Jewish zealot who persecuted the Christians, who then converts, as we know, the light on the road to Damascus. But in, I think, the epistle to the Romans, he says that one of the most painful things to him as a formerly observant Jew is the reluctance of the Jewish people to sign up to the new faith. And you see in Paul the anguish of a Jew wishing that the Jewish people would accept um, uh, the Christian message and discovering to his sorrow and rage and difficulty that they, they won't. But Christian anti-Semitism is the religion of fools in the simple sense that without the Jewish faith, there would be no Christianity. The whole faith is built upon uh, the rock of the, Christ, of, of the Hebrew Bible. Um, most notably, and most importantly, the ways in which the Hebrew Bible is used by the entire Christian tradition to validate the Christian message. The frequency with which the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Ezekiel, are cited in Christian texts as as foretellers, predictors, that the Messiah will come. Uh, when I call anti these forms of anti-Semitism the socialism of fools, of fools, of fools, I don't mean by any means that 
anti-Semites are stupid or that it's profitable or useful to think about anti-Semitism as a form of foolishness. I mean something slightly different. I mean that, take the socialism of fools, there is a very strong case that there is something badly wrong with capitalism, okay? I happen to be an old liberal. I don't buy, I'm not, I haven't got an anti-capitalist bone in my body, but there is a case you can make that there's something deeply, structurally, strategically wrong with capitalism. But it is foolish, that is, it is empirically incorrect to attribute what is wrong with capitalism to the Jews. That's, that's what I mean when I say that it is the socialism of fools. Okay. Um, I think it's very important, before I move on, to notice that in all of these three cases, anti-Semitism travels with a lot of other ideology, anti-capitalist ideology, nationalist ideologies, hostilities to other groups. Anti-Semitism is always paired with a cluster of other mistaken and often dangerous beliefs. It's one of the reasons why anti-Semitism is so specially dangerous, because it has a cathecting effect of pulling together a lot of other extremely dangerous uh, and hostile ideas. Okay, let's, um, I want to, uh, I, I think reference has been made by the uh, Vice Rector already to um, this recent piece of research by the Austin, Austrian Institute for Empirical Social Research. I'm a foreigner here, look, the purpose of these slides is not to make you all nervous and anxious and it's not to indict anybody. I'm just giving you the results of a poll of 2,000 Austrians recently conducted and reported to the Austrian parliament and it's kind of interesting, so let's look at it. Um, Jews today try to take advantage of the fact that they were victims during the Nazi era. 36% of people polled in Austria say yes. Jews dominate the international business world. 33% agree. If the state of Israel no longer existed, then there would be peace in the Middle East. 50% of Austrian, Austrians of immigrant origin uh, agree, and a slightly lower percentage of Austrian-born uh, Austrians uh, agree with that statement. And then again, I'm against the fact that people keep rehashing the fact that Jews died in the Second World War. 33% agree. To give context for these results, I think it's important to note two facts. 54% of the Austrian population, according to this census, display no anti-Semitic feelings, whatever. Keep that in mind. A majority of Austrians do not subscribe to these mistaken beliefs, to, to put it politely. Um, so that's one uh, thing. But the second fact that I think makes all this puzzling is, well, let's do a skill testing question. How many of you know how many Jews there are in Austria? What's the right number for how many Jews there are in Austria? Yeah? 10,000? 10,000 is what you, pretty good. Uh, it depends how you count. Eight to ten thousand is a number I've heard. Okay, up to fifteen, depending on how you count. Okay, our top number is fifteen thousand. What's the population of, of Austria? Nine million. Fifteen thousand top number of nine million people. But a third of the population thinks that Jews take advantage of the fact that they were victims during the Nazi era. So you've got a complicated phenomenon here, folks. You've got people who have never seen a Jew, never been in company with a Jew, believing this about Jews. Okay? 
So this is the phenomenon often described as anti-Semitism without Jews. And we just need to try and understand what's going on. There are a variety of hypotheses, and I hope we will try some out in our discussion, because I'm not sure I've got any answers. One hypothesis, a psychological one, is the less you actually know about an ethnic group, the more likely you are to have negative feelings about them. So this is a story about ignorance. Maybe. But it's also equally possible that these are attitudes that are kind of in the groundwater of the culture and are independent of whether you do or do not have contact with Jews. If you had more contact with Jews, the hopeful hypothesis is these percentages would go down. Actual knowledge, life with Jews, who are like, as Dorothy Parker famously said, just like everybody else, only more so, right? These numbers would change. But these numbers exist in a situation where most Austrians have no actual contact with Jews at all. 85% of the Jewish population lives in Vienna, if I got my numbers right. So there's some puzzles here. No one, certainly not me, is saying Austrians are anti-Semitic. 54% of them have no discernible anti-Semitic attitudes. But there's some puzzling things about these um, these uh, statistics, and it would be interesting to think about them. And as a foreigner, I'm not in a position to interpret. It's your problem. Okay. Let me now switch to another phenomenon, which is anti-Semitism without anti-Semites. And this is a personal story, obviously. This is a... Um, an underground, a, a metro stop in Budapest sometime in 19, 2017 during the Hungarian election campaign of 2018. Every single poster in those subways had the cut line, George smiling, don't let Soros have the last laugh. It was everywhere. It's the most total um, poster campaign I've ever seen a political campaign. This is in 2017. And as you will know, in 2018, Viktor Orban won a substantial majority. It was a successful campaign. Um, he made George Soros the number one enemy of the Hungarian uh, population for a period of 18 months. And the university which I had the honor to lead, was funded by George Soros. So we got caught in the crossfire. And one of the reasons I'm standing here in Vienna with you is that we had to, we had to leave Hungary. We, Orban declared our university illegal, and so we had to move to a more hospital, hospitable environment and had a wonderful welcome in Vienna, and we're here for, to stay. But we need to look at this iconography a little more closely. Because here's what's complicated, okay? One of the oldest tropes in anti-Semitic rhetoric is the Jews are laughing at us. The Jews are laughing at us. If you look at the Volkische Bullbachter of 1933, you'll see a lot of the Jews are laughing at us. In one of the most important speeches that Hitler gave in 1939 on the eve of the war, in which he said, when the war comes, we will destroy the Jews, the phrasing that Hitler uses in that speech as he builds up to that chilling prophecy was, the Jews have been laughing at me for a very long time, but we are going to wipe the smile off their faces. So the laughing Jew is, a, is, a, is a not an incidental trope here. And it has been used and deployed in a European election in 2017. Now here's what makes it complicated. If you say to Viktor Orban, look, 
Don't you realize that this is a Nazi trope? The Jews are laughing at us. Viktor Orban will say, what are you talking about? I am a strong supporter of the state of Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu is a close personal friend. And ask the Jews in Budapest what I've done for them. I've rebuilt their synagogues. I've funded Jewish organizations. I have very, very close relationships with the uh, Orthodox Jewish community. And all of that's true. So what are you looking at here? It's complicated. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's easy work to say, Victor, you're just an anti-Semite. Come on. And you say, absolutely not. I am not an anti-Semite. But he's using tropes that he must know have a vicious history. Okay? So this is what I mean about an anti-Semitism without anti-Semites. That is, the, the public discursive mode about anti-Semitism is that a third of the population in Austria may have anti-Semitic views, but no one will say, I'm an anti-Semite. Viktor Orban will deploy vicious anti-Semitic stereotypes about laughing Jews, but will indignantly and possibly with conviction deny that he's an, an, an anti-Semite. So this is the strange world we're in with a set of convictions that will not say their name in public, okay? Um, and that's why I've shown you this, this slide, okay. This takes me, I think, to my penultimate point. I only have two more slides you'll be relieved to know and then we'll get down to real good discussion. The prohibition on overt political anti-Semitism um, has been a feature of European politics since 1945, the human rights era, not universally uh, adhered to. We know in Austria that there's been what could be called dog whistle anti-Semitism. Dog whistle is when a politician admits a signal that only a dog can hear. That is, they use anti-Semitic tropes um, to reach a certain population. Haider and others have notorious for this, but I mean what I'm saying here, official in the program, we will do X, Y, and Z towards dealing with the Jewish problem. That is out of European politics and has been since 1945. Orban knows that, so there can't be anything official and public about controlling the Jewish influence uh, in Hungary. But I, Peter Pulzer, the great historian of uh, anti-Semitism in Austria and um, Germany uh, before 1914, indicates that one of the signals that should worry us is if the taboo is broken. That is the moment at which anti-Semitic rhetoric and anti-Semitic programs enter into the political debate as a conscious and deliberate matter. We have not broken that taboo yet, but that it seems to me is the tripwire that we have good reason to be uh, concerned about going forward. I will now conclude, uh, not in my own words, but in the words of a person much wider, wiser than me, which is the great Yehuda Bauer. Yehuda Bauer is an emeritus professor at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, born in Czechoslovakia, um, a wonderful and wise man, who said, anti-Semitism cannot be fought unless it's understood that it is a danger not just to the Jewish minority, but to the society in which it spreads. This is a, this is a profound remark. Anti-Semitism is not the business of Jews, not the business of Jews alone. Anti-Semitism is dangerous because it clusters with it a series of attitudes towards cosmopolitans, towards liberals, towards gays, towards a whole cluster of populations 
um, that end up amounting to a danger to society as a whole. Um, Anti-Semitism never travels alone. It always clusters with a set of other attitudes which endanger all of us. And that sense of the danger to all of us seems to me a very important thing that we should all uh, think about because self-evidently when Jews alone are left to defend themselves it will be more than too late. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, we've uh, agreed with the panel that uh, in the first round everybody will uh, make an uh, opening statement uh, uh, for themselves and also uh, if uh, adequate uh, respond uh, or remark at, uh, uh, to what uh, Professor Ignatiev has uh, uh, told us and has spoken about. And I'd like to uh, start with uh, Professor Imbacher and uh, the floor is yours. Okay. I would like to, to add something, what, what you said about Orban and Kurt, Kurt Farrell, because I think this is a real important or very dangerous phenomenon worldwide. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and for me, this is something really new, or it's a, it's, we, we have to deal with it, because this started, I would say, in approximately 2005, when right-wing parties... Uh, thank you. Okay. Okay, it gets better. When, when, the ex, when extreme right-wing parties changed uh, their, as we tried to uh, approach Israel, let's say, became very pro-Israel. The first one, I think, was Gert Wilders, the, the Dutch uh, politician, and they, they visited Israel and they met mainly right-wing politicians in, in Israel. And uh, in 2010, this was especially interesting, Strache followed, uh, followed. And only in 2009, the FBI was very anti-Israel. There was a war in Gaza and they supported Hamas. In 2006, they supported Hezbollah and the war in Lebanon. And all of a sudden, they changed their, 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 their view or the politician towards Israel. And I think this is a very dangerous phenomenon that we have right-wing party, extreme right-wing parties who are pro-Israel and also try to approach the Jewish communities. They try to instrumentalize Jews and they try to instrumentalize certain Jews like Chabad in, in Hungary or whatever fits into their concept. And now we have right-wing parties that are pro-Israel but also anti-homosexuals, anti-globalists, anti-liberals, that fit all in this cluster you described. And it's, I think it's an offer to some of their followers. Like in America, it's very spread or widespread among, uh, if, if, uh, among the Republican Party, like McCarthy or the Centers are very pro-Israel, but it's more an offer to the evangelical voters stand with the Jewish communities. So we have to deal with this phenomenon now. And concerning Orban, I think it's not only who loves, who is, who is the last who loves, it goes also in this conspiracy theory about the Great Reset. Because this was exactly what uh, Orban studied with the so-called refugee crisis in 2015 when he accused Orban of having orchestrated this refugee stream into Europe and changed Europe from a Christian Europe into a Muslim Europe. And in the US you have the same 
uh, same ideas or same conspiracy theory here, here it's not against Muslim mainly, but against uh, changing America from a colored country into, in, in a colored country or multicolored. And uh, so we have also this really dangerous uh, conspiracy of, of the Great Reset. And this is very, uh, you, you find it, uh, uh, look at the corona demonstrations, you could see all these <laughs> posters, placards with Great Reset, and leading politicians, especially from the FPÖ, march behind this placard, and also Strache, for example, supported the Great Reset, arguing that uh, Netanyahu also support, <laughs> is, is enter, is enter Soros. So this is, it gets very complicated and for, like for teachers it's hard to explain all these complicated connections. So this is one point and I think this is also a problem for Israel and diaspora because I think Orban really left the Jewish community alone when, when uh, Netanyahu left the Jewish community alone in Hungary when, when he he used Orban uh, uh, Soros for his anti-Semitic politics. The other one, uh, the other argument I want to make, or point I want to make are the polls. It's the third poll you, you mentioned. And what I was kind of, I think th th these polls also have side effects. I looked at the reports in all the newspapers. Uh, how, how did the report? What you see is a picture, a huge picture, of a Jewish man with a kippah after all these polls. So I think this adds to a very homogeneous image of Jews. Jews in Austria are men and religious. Mm -hmm. They're and what? They're religious and men. Everybody wears a kippah. They always show Jews with kippahs. Not we, no women. <laughs> but yeah, but, but look at the newspapers. Or, or, or if there is an anti-Semitic incident, they always show Jews with a kippah. And I think it's very important to see that even this small Jewish community in Vienna is a very heterogeneous community, and we should know more. We should not only know the number of this Jewish community, but also where are these Jews coming from. This is not... Many politicians like pretend it's still this old community from the 20s and 30s. Hardly, of, hardly anybody of this community is left. They are Bukharic or, or, or from, from a Soviet Union or whatever, but people don't know about that. It's a very one-sided image we get. And the other point concerning these polls is that there's also a problematic view about Islam because, like, in these polls, um, there are only certain groups of the Muslim population. Uh, for example, Bosnian Muslims are never included in this poll, and I think we would get a different image, and we should also analyze what's the difference be between a Syrian refugee and a Turkish Muslim who has been living here in third generation or whatever. So I think it, we should be more uh, cautious with these polls. So I think I make a point here. Um, do you hear me? No. Okay, works. First of all, Professor Ignatiev, uh, there's not much I can add to what you have been telling us. Uh, when we are between us, we often say antisemitism is the sickness of the antisemites. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not uh, something which uh, uh, we take easy or take uh, for granted, and we've been fighting antisemitism since I can think of. On the other hand, we've been living with antisemitism for 2,500 years now, and uh, I don't say we are used to it, but we have learned how to live with it. And what you said is so right, that at the end of the day, antisemitism, uh, when it becomes really so strong, it affects more everybody else than the Jews who have learned to live with it. So I'm not saying it's good, I'm just trying to explain how we, how we have learned to live with it. Secondly, 
anti-Semitism in Austria today has a lot of sources, but as you mentioned, there is this old right-wing classical anti-Semitism, what we call, which has been, when I came to this country some uh, 68 years ago, uh, predominant, 70 or more percent of the population. Today, I would say the classic anti-Semitism is down to somewhere, depending on how you do the, the poll of the research, to by 3%, 5%, 25%, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really a minority who you can call the extreme right wing antisemites. The second group is the antisemitism from the left, and then it's mostly anti-Zionism or, or unjust criticism, uh, criticism of Israel and whatever happens in Israel, it's the Jews, it's the, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's the Zionist uh, colonialism or whatever they want to call it. And then there is the, th uh, the third group, and I think here it's the biggest danger today in, in Europe, and that's the migrants who came from North Africa and who came from Turkey and who came from Syria, Afghanistan, etc. And here we can see today an anti-Semitism which becomes violent, an anti-Semitism which is a, a physical danger to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Meaning, here you have something where you have demonstrations on the streets where they chant death to the Jews and they mean it. Mm -hmm. So that's something where the police, the law enforcement agencies and others have to intervene and our school systems and our education systems and our integration systems practically don't work. Mm -hmm. We've seen, th those of you who have been watching yesterday television, you've seen uh, the, the festivities after Erdogan's uh, uh, winning election uh, on the streets of Favoriten. And all the Austrian uh, news and media were discussing how is it possible that third generation Turkish youngsters mm -hmm. are chanting and, 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 and and, and, and having a, a feast on the streets uh, that Erdogan uh, won. So the issue was, uh, apparently, integration in this country doesn't work. And it doesn't work with Turks, it doesn't work with many migrants, and it has a result of this type of uh, reactions. Uh, people just don't understand that the third or fourth generation Turks who have been living in this country have been educated in a democratic system, uh, vote mainly, I mean, uh, this is what I hear from polls, mainly social democratic when, it, when the election are in Austria, but when it comes to Turkey, they, they vote for Erdogan. How, this, how does this go together? And that's a very f uh, interesting phenomenon. It shows you how these uh, emotions seem to play. Now, um, um, I, I, as a president of the European Jewish Congress, I often think, okay, the last 50 years of my life, or 55 years of my life, I've been fighting anti-Semitism, and to be honest, yes, we have some kind of uh, success. We think that there's a large part of population of Austria today which um, does not accept anti-Semitism, where there's a large civil society who definitely today uh, um, fights anti-Semitism and opposes anti-Semitism. This is why you said very rightly no political party uh, today would openly declare anti-Semitism part of its program. At the same time, you rightly mentioned the codes of Haider and company uh, to, to play this anti-Semitic uh, uh, games uh, before uh, each election. Now, when he had the conflict with me, it cost him 3% of the votes because they went to the other side because we, we really clashed on, on those codes. Mm. Which means in those days, many Austrians, and there, is, uh, there has been a lot of research done, clashing of Haider with me in, in those days, Ariel and, and Weiss Wester and Dreckamsteck mm. and all that, cost him votes instead of, of, of bringing him votes, which shows that the Austrians are not anti-Semites uh, by, by birth. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not something which happened, some people say it, it comes with the mother milk. It's not true. Mm -hmm. 
It comes with a cultural and, and religious and political environment which has been in this country for too long. But yes, we are successful in, in, in turning many people around and if uh, Wirtschaftsuniversity today has such a seminar, well, I, I was there when we had Borodakiewicz and all the rest uh, in Vienna. So that's only, what, uh, 1968? So mm -hmm. how much? Uh, 32, uh, 50 and 5 some years ago? The majority of the students were declared neo-Nazis mm -hmm. in certain faculties. And we had fist fights with them on the university. When I was a student in medical, uh, in a school of medicine, we went to the uh, to the university main building, and we had fist fights with them. Mm -hmm. So things have changed dramatically. That VU does not uh, this seminary and, and has a program and invites you to, to talk on all this. For me, the class is more than half full. Mm -hmm. And no, we will not get rid of anti Semitism in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could they? Could they just? just uh, I have it no It's It's funktioniert. Also, it's good. Okay. Uh, I would like to add something concerning these changes. Like I'm teaching at University of Salzburg. I never had any problems with anti-Semitism. But what I realize is that the students are third, fourth generation. They don't recognize certain codes anymore. Like Ostküste. I, I didn't know that either. So Ostküste is something they've never heard. And there's another one, I w I'm really astounded. They don't know what a ritual, ritual mod is. I think it's great. <laughs> but on the other hand, they also don't know what religion. But they don't know what durch den Rost gefallen mean, or no, they don't no. mean bis zur Vergasung. Yeah. All these things, they don't understand those words. Yeah. Right, And but the also don't know about religion because you, you mentioned religion or they don't know anything about their own religion, mainly Catholics, and they don't know anything about Jewish religion. So they don't know the difference between the Judaism and Christianity. So it's a very totally new world now, especially among the students. And I think this is a challenge for us to teach because I don't know what do they know, what don't they know. And you, know, you have to know a lot to recognize anti-Semitism, the concept of anti-Semitism. It, it's not always easy to, to recognize if you don't have the knowledge. And especially concerning the history of Israel, there's hardly any knowledge. So how do you recognize what's wrong when, when you cross the, the line between criticizing Israel and, and being it's a, a legitimate critic or, or it's anti-Semitism? So, and, and because you may also mentioned left wing, who is left in Austria now? This is an, another pro, uh, question, I think. The, it's very different than in the 70s it's, or it's 80s. It's a bad word. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's BDS, maybe. <laughs> I'm not scared about them because, like, my students have never heard about BDS. And I, I think maybe I should not teach them, uh, <laughs> teach them about it because then they, they get the idea. <laughs> but just one sentence. Uh, it's very simple. IRA definition says it very specifically. You can criticize Israel, you can criticize the government of Israel as long as you don't do the, the three Ds, which means as long as it is something which is not specifically and only against Israel. Uh, if you, if you uh, take Israel out and have 27 uh, resolution against Israel every year and seven resolution against everybody else in the United Nations, that's anti-Semitic. Because you have chosen Israel specifically as a target and specifically as a victim. So there are definitions today, and we are fighting for IRA, by the way, in the United Nations right now. There has been a, uh, several countries have tried to, to, to get IRA away because they don't like IRA definition. Mm. So we are fighting now to have IRA definition recognized by the United Nations because it gives a clear... Um, difference, what is anti-Semitic and what is not. Mm. I am criticizing uh, many members of the, Israeli, of the current Israeli government, which I consider extreme right, fascists and people who shouldn't be in an Israeli government. I usually do that in Israel and not here, but I, I do it and it's not anti-Semitic. 
Yeah. Uh, but it's not that clear, I think, from where... It's, it's difficult, but it's there's, clear. There are some grey zones. I would say there are grey zones, and there are very educated experts who have different op opinions sometimes, and we have to deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you um, uh, two questions, in fact. The first was about um, what you said about uh, uh, migrants to, to Austria. Um, I don't think there's any question that the integration of um, some Muslims um, has been difficult because they've been politicized, heavily politicized. And your point was there is violence. There's actual people get killed. Um, France, Germany, we don't need to go through. Austria. And Austria. What's your story, though? Is this... Are you saying it's just never going to work, or are you saying give it time? Maybe this is the Canadian liberal in me, but we've had massive um, migration of Muslims uh, to my hometown, Toronto, for example. And... <clears throat> It's not easy. I'm not going to sing you a happy story, but my sense is over third generation, fourth generation, it does begin to change. You seem to be saying something much more pessimistic. Am I right? Well, uh, I know Canada quite well, and I know why you're saying that, because Canada is really the light in the nations when it comes to integration of, of migrants. I haven't seen many countries who are doing it as well as Canada. So you're really an island in the, in the sea, as far as this is concerned. Yeah. And secondly, uh, it's, a, it's a country of, of migrants. Everybody a, was a migrant to Canada one day. Yeah. So it is easier than when you have a situation where those who live here say that the, 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 this boat is full, the, 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 the boat is full, we don't yeah. want anybody from the outside yeah. to come. And plus, in Canada, you have a very, very large pluralism of people from India and people from I don't know where. Mm -hmm. uh, for us in Austria, it is a very, very unpleasant shock of culture uh, mm -hmm. when you have uh, people coming here from a, a, from a background which is so different and the majority of the country is, you, if you want it or not, is a, is a Catholic, uh, conservative country. And then you have people coming uh, here and saying the Sharia has to overrule everything. Right. Um, it is also the problem that you have uh, people who are indoctrinated by, by, by years and years of anti-Semitic TV shows, anti-Semitic newspapers, anti-Semitic they have been brainwashed. Mm -hmm. So when we have done research with uh, migrants coming, let's say, from Syria or from these type of countries, the, the anti-Semitism seen in this uh, population group is three times, four times, five times higher than uh, in the normal Austrians. And yes, it's going to change, but it's going to take much more time and effort, and I'm not sure that the Austrian responsibles are putting enough effort into changing it. Mm -hmm. There is uh, two, three hours of courses here or there, but we are sending kids from our Jewish schools on special educational trips to uh, Viennese schools. There's 80 youngsters, 15, 16 years old, who have, are educated. They call themselves Likrat. It's a, it's a program which we, we, we promote. And they go to typical schools where there's practically no Jew. But me, at least 50% of the classes are Muslim. And they start talking to their comrades, same age group. You would be surprised on the questions they got. Uh, why do the Jews don't pay taxes? Why is this? Why? You get the most um, impossible questions. I have two grandchildren, by the way, in this program, so I get them firsthand. <laughs> It's unbelievable. They are completely brainwashed when they come here, and there is not 
much of 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 uh, involvement in the in the in the Austrian school system to teach them otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. let, let me can I just could I could I briefly interrupt? Uh, sure. Uh, 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 <laughs> Sorry if I'm too long. No, no, uh, but. Uh, the future rector of uh, VU, uh, who has kindly honored us with uh, his presence, uh, he might uh, think something along the lines, um, what are these strange guys in the management department doing uh, with uh, VU? Well, they, I know he thinks that, uh, but uh, thinks that maybe specifically <laughs> here uh, on the podium, he says, this is uh, Vienna University of Economic, Economics and Business, and I haven't heard, the, or nearly haven't heard the word business or at the workplace uh, yeah. once uh, now. Uh, and maybe some of you also uh, were thinking, hmm, uh, uh, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what's the panel talking about? Very, very important things. Uh, so I'd like to kind of throw out uh, to the panel the question that drove us, uh, and uh, the Vice Rector Lang has, uh, uh, kind of pointed at that in, in this initiative, anti-Semitism at work or at the workplace, uh, this kind of gaping hole where you say, okay, we see this phenomenon in all strata of society, in very, very different areas. Dr. Musikant is a, 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 a very successful business person himself. Uh, and if you look at the academic research, if you look at empirical evidence, there is next to nothing in kind of, uh, in the uh, overall economics, a little bit in the past, yes, but if you look uh, over the last 10, 15 years, there is nearly nothing uh, uh, academic-wise, research-wise, hard, good data, despite uh, kind of uh, everyday evidence, a story here, a story there, and I could tell you a number of these stories. So what's the reason for that? Uh, uh, what's the reason why uh, this uh, gaping hole in, uh, in academia, a kind of uh, yelling silence, so to say? Uh, Dr. Musikant. Well, first of all, I think uh, Professor Gnatsev said very well uh, the, the sentence, anti-Semitism without anti-Semites. I mean, when you can tell stories, we can tell them both. We are not going to do that now. But... When I encounter anti-Semitism in my business uh, activity and I get angry at somebody who, who makes anti-Semitic remarks, he, the first reaction will be, well, I have so many Jewish friends and how can you call me an anti-Semite? Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's really a, a sickness that people don't, do not recognize themselves the stereotype uh, anti-Semitism they have. And if they do, or if they, they, at least with themselves, agree that, yes, there is a little bit of antisemitism in there, they are always ashamed to, 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 to recognize it and to fight it because it is uh, so uh, impossible in the business life. I mean, uh, uh, in, in, in today's world, to have... Uh, I mean, I, I once uh, had a project uh, where I had, was supposed to sell apartments uh, on Wörthersee, which were built there by a very prominent uh, local guy. And at one point, I, I didn't get the contract, and I was wondering what's going on. And then somebody called me up and says, you know, we don't sell to Jews. Hmm? Kärnten, Wörthersee. And it happens. It happens every day. And, 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 and I was in a negotiation, and somebody tells me, Herr Musikant, wir sind doch in keiner Judenschule. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. <laughs> so these things happen. And obviously, I'm a, I'm a magnet for that because uh, people know how I uh, react aggressively against it. But I, I, would, I would say for the, for the Austrian people, it is less possible here than, for example, in France, where you have it much more and nobody even has a shock here after the Shoah and after what happened. People have a certain... Uh, feeling not to, to, to go so far. In France, for example, day in, day out. And why is it not researched and, and, and why is there no, no, no... Because it's not an issue. It's not, um, it's not tangible. Uh, and it doesn't affect people that it still exists because they don't see the consequences. Because as you rightly said, 
then it goes against LGBT, then it goes against women, then it goes against all the minorities. But this is something people don't realize. And that's the problem of anti-Semitism, that it is a phenomenon which hits more everybody else than the Jews who have learned to live with it. Any other views from the panel uh, because of, uh, about this issue uh, of uh, the kind of uh, yelling silence in business areas, uh, in business research, in work, uh, every workday? Uh, because otherwise I would open up the floor to the, the, uh, uh, to the yeah, audience. Let's go out. Yeah. So there will be somebody, yes, already coming with the microphone. Uh, are there any questions, remarks, statements by uh, uh, members of the audience? Uh, and uh, we have one of our kind of very well-known uh, visiting researchers, uh, Navel. Yeah, just, uh, just go ahead. Hello, um, I'm Navel. I'm French. So I was listening to your <laughs> points on France. I'm quite surprised because, um, for example, in HRM in France, we have um, studies that are starting on what we call the, uh, the, uh, the religious fact in the company. I don't know if it works in English. Le fait religieux. Anyway. Le quoi? Le fait religieux. Oui. The, the, so, the religious facts. Yeah, yeah. that's it. And, and they study the religious facts in all the HR practices, um, behaviors, and everything in companies. But we don't, um, and it's quite new though, but we don't uh, separate anti Semitism and uh, what we will call in France Islamophobia or something like that. So everything is gathered together. So for us, there is the problem, we deal with the problem of religion in the workplace but not specifically um, with anti-Semitism because it's not, I mean, it doesn't mean that it's the same thing for Islam and uh, Jewish people, I mean, Muslim and Jewish people, but we, there's no studies that make the difference between the two. So I don't mm. know, uh, just the point I wanted to make. Thank you very much. Uh, just just on, that, on that precise point, if I understood it, um, there was a, a, a recent gathering of Jewish leaders in Porto, in Portugal, Correct. That, had a, that made a point about this issue in which, if I understood it correctly, the Jewish leadership was saying, don't mix anti-Semitism with all the other forms of prejudice and discrimination because it's specific to the honestly, Jewish people. Honestly, it was, a, it was a debate about what's called intersectionality, and I didn't quite understand it, but I, I, my, my, my ignorant worry was this, which is, if you start saying our problem is different than everybody else's, I, I then fully you disagree. lose... I fully disagree with the group in Porto, which was the Chabad rabbis, <laughs> oh, who okay. are uh, not representing right. uh, the Jewish mainstream. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> fine, fine, you say fine. that. <laughs> All is clear, thank you. Okay. Any further questions, statements, remarks? Uh, yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe George Soros is an asshole. Is there any way I can criticize him without being perceived as anti-Semitic? I'm criticizing him. Yes, definitely. There are even books written about that. You can criticize uh, what he did. Uh... Because every time I see something about George Soros, Was the reaction, especially from the left, Democratic Party in the United States, for example, is always this is an anti-Semitic trope. No matter what is said about him, especially from the Republican side, the Democrat side will always say this is an anti-Semitic trope. The, the, the right and the center right in Israel is anti soros as anti soros you could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm just Quoting uh, Bibi Netanyahu hates Soros at least at, as much as uh, uh, Orban. Why? That's a long story uh, and we don't want to get into that. Uh, Soros has his views. He's very outspoken on his views. He is not liked by uh, a large group of people because of his views. And you can criticize him. But what Orban is doing, and this is what Professor Ignatiev uh, was, was, was pointing out, Soros is being used as a sort of 
the Jewish conspiracy against Hungary. And that's not allowed. That's anti-Semitism. The world Jewish conspiracy in the face of Soros, who wants to destroy Hungary by bringing in millions of uh, refugees. Did he, ever say, did he ever say that, though? Well, he yes. says it in a much... He so says he said, it... So, so he says it in, Orban a, in, said in a... He said it in a very clear way in 2015. There is a Jewish conspiracy? Yeah. Okay. In 2015, it started and in even Hungary. if he doesn't use the word, he says it in a way that everybody understands what he means. Uh, Professor Ignazi was speaking of codes, was speaking of, of clear hints so that everybody understands... Uh, uh, Professor Embacher was speaking of Ostküsten lobby. When you in, in Austria you speak about Ostküsten lobby, you don't have to use the word Jews. Everybody knows what you want to express by that. So if you use certain codes and certain words and certain uh, expressions in the connection with somebody who is Jewish, everybody will understand what you mean. And he is actually uh, years ago Rothschild was the symbol for for conspiracies in ruling the world, also in America. Yeah. <laughs> and now I think Soros uh, somehow replaced this code of, of Rothschild, and especially among Republicans in, in the US, it's, it's really widespread. And, uh, and do you know this QAnon conspiracy? They, 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 they mention Soros in, in this conspiracy. Mm -hmm. so. and any further questions? So if questions? you say you, you don't like how he invested his money or that he is giving his money to liberal organizations because you don't like what some liberal organizations do in Israel, this is totally okay. But if, you, if it goes into a conspiracy in a world view that he is running the world or, or he's using his money to change the world, then it's getting anti-Semitic. So he's changing his money, he's using his money yeah. to change the world? Yeah. Yeah, because this is a conspiracy. Just a second. I'm saying not any Jews from Iceland. He using his money and there is anti Semitic. No, no, he is using his he's he's organizing. I would I would, okay. I would suggest yeah, that I would suggest you have a personal short, yeah. conversation afterwards uh, to kind of clarify this issue, which is uh, I think clearly of great interest uh, to at least the two of you. That's uh, also uh, very valuable. I have Professor Bindel. The, uh, the only thing I'd like to ask, I hope you'll t you'll understand this as a joke, but it's also true. George Soros has invested massively in causes that he supports for the last 15 years. He's lost almost every battle he's fought. I think it's important to remember that. The idea of that, you know, this mastermind is, you know, manipulating the world is pretty comic if you, if you run a university that just got thrown out of a country by Viktor Orban. Who won that battle? It certainly wasn't George Soros. Mm -hmm. Do you know that uh, Viktor Orban was once a, a, scholar. <laughs> a, a, a scholar of of this university? He used grants to go to this to, to this university. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Okay, Regine. Thank you very much for your different perspectives. I have two questions. The first question is a more general one, and it's about a gendered perspective of anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. because I think there must be some perspectives on this. And the second question is uh, about the workplace. In order to do workplace, uh, in order to, res to do research on anti-Semitism at the workplace, it also needs, from my perspective, access to the target group. And my question is now to you, how can we have access how can we as non-Jews have access to the Jewish target group and what do we have to do, to offer, to look for, to be aware of if we want to have access to this target group? Just go ahead. Well, I don't think you need access to the Jews. What you need access is you take, you take a certain profession. Let's take real estate and you contact uh, real estate companies, real estate brokers, real estate uh, agents, whoever works in real estate. And you, and you start discussing with them, either by a poll or by whatever, uh, the, the typical questions. Do you think that the Jews are dominating uh, real estate? Do you think that the Jews uh, have all the money? 
the, 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 the standard questions you ask. And you will, will find very quickly that in, in a country like Austria, where 95% of the people in real estate are non-Jews, there's a huge belief that the Jews own all the real estate in Austria. If you do the same thing with the lawyers, you, 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 you talk to a hundred, you take a sample of a hundred lawyers and you discuss with them if they have encountered anti-Semitism. And you will hear how many of the colleagues are Jewish. You'll find out, I think there is 10, maximum 10 Jews who are lawyers in Vienna out of, I don't know, 15,000. <laughs> so you just take a group, a professional group, uh, doctors, lawyers, real estate, and you do research in this group. You don't need us for that. And we will be helpful in, in helping you to, to maybe to ask the right questions. But uh, uh, there is uh, 10, 15,000 Jews. Uh, one, one little correction. If you take everybody who has a Jewish grandfather, mm -hmm. it's going to be a larger number. But they're not right. considered Jews by themselves. So why right. should we consider them Jewish? Right. The gender perspective, uh, would you like to say something uh, about that? Uh, yeah, the same it's, a, it's a really important question because I think there's a, a big uh, uh, this, uh, research, this, uh, uh, we, we don't know too much. And look at the polls uh, that were quoted before. We don't ask or, or they don't ask, uh, they don't differentiate between gender. They don't also differentiate between political preferences, what I think would be very important, so then you have more options. But there's some, there are some debates in, in the US, uh, and it's about intersectionalism. Like there are feminist groups, and this group uh, uh, don't permit Jewish women because they regard it as white and Zionists. So there are all kinds of debates now. Just one sentence, if I may. Uh, I, when I was asked by, by Wirtschaftsuniversität, uh, Mrs. Hanapi, if we could. Um, I, I really didn't know what to answer at the first point because real uh, anti-Semitism and business was something where I, I didn't really feel that I had any knowledge. FRA, which is the uh, agency of the European Union, is conducting a, a fantastic uh, uh, research in uh, 13 European countries, including Austria. They have a, a, a report which is coming out every four years, which is 200 pages. If you contact FRA, they are sitting here in Vienna on, uh, in the 4th District, and you do a, a program with them that in their uh, research and polls and surveys, you put in your, your uh, questions or your... That could be something to, to get you started. FRA is, is neutral. FRA is an agency for human rights of the European Commission. It's not uh, anywhere related to Jews or to anybody else, and they are doing fantastic work. Mm -hmm. So if Wirtschaftsuniversität wants to have polls done or wants to have research done or wants to combine yourself with FRA, mm -hmm. I would like to, to add something to your question, it w what relates to your question that Muslims are the most dangerous group for Jews. I, I agree that there's a real problem, especially looking at France, but we should not forget about Halle and der Saale, for example, about Pittsburgh, about this right wing, and, and most of this right wing uh, terrorists, I would say, also in New Zealand are men who are isolated and just uh, living home, home or these lonely wolves. And this is a very male uh, phenomenon, I would say. And, yeah. and who are the victims? Are these mainly males? No, no, they, were Jewish, they just attack Jewish communities or synagogues, yeah. They attack yeah. anybody in yeah. France. They killed in the Bataclan. They didn't kill the yeah. Jews. They and killed anybody. And also a, a, a Turkish man in, in Salem who, who was there by, by coincidence. But concerning workplace, I would like to add uh, uh, one point, and that's philo-Semitism. This is uh, I experience at university. That's very different to, to what you experience. Like I would say it's more open anti-Semitism. But in my field, I think it's... Uh, 
this uh, being very scared to say something wrong in a debate. Uh, because people are, don't want to be anti-Semitic, don't want to say something that might be anti-Israel or anti-Zionist, so they don't say anything. Or just say, oh, then this man darf nichts mehr sagen, we can't see anything. This, this could be a result of that. How many Jews are afraid to say the, wo the word Jude? How Think many of it. How many, yeah. how many uh, people in Austria would not use the word Jude? Because it still has a negative connotation mm -hmm. and people are afraid to use it. It's, it's, it's a phenomenon in Austria. But, but they start uh, speaking about Mosaic, Israelitish, mm -hmm. trying to... Jude, sag, sprich's aus, Jude. No, no, God forbid, they are afraid to be called antisemites because they say Jude. But like when I wrote my first article, I was very young about Jews in Salzburg. I didn't call it Jews. I, call, I, I, wrote, I used the title Jüdische Mitbürger <laughs> until I figured out how stupid that was. But so we have, there's always a learned process and <laughs> there are new people coming. And <laughs> Look a little bit at uh, the clock, uh, which is uh, directly over there, so everybody can view it, and we are supposed to finish by 7.30. Uh, uh, so uh, the only thing that is between my final uh, question and uh, uh, the, uh, the buffet is your answer. Uh, so uh, 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 to the, uh, maybe a, a brief uh, uh, final remark. Uh, uh, about uh, being here at Wirtschaftsuniversität, educating the next generation of uh, people in the economy in various important places, uh, some of them becoming uh, future business leaders. Uh, what would be your recommendation, given the broad topic that we have uh, debated uh, today, what would be your recommendation for us as educators, as people shaping, the, or shaping, uh, contributing to kind of people shape their own lives? Uh, that's probably the better expression. What would be uh, the recommendations that you could give uh, to us uh, here mm. at the university uh, looking at uh, this education of uh, uh, the next uh, generation uh, in business? Uh, Succinct, very brief, uh, last round, whoever wants to start. Uh, yeah, we go, uh, Dr. Musikant, uh, you, 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 just, you just go ahead and then well, we go to the, uh, uh, Professor Imbacher and then uh, Professor Ignatius. I, I would just say two sentences. Sure. First of all, don't use the word tolerance, which is so much used from the English uh, 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 understanding, but use the word respect. We must have much more mutual respect one to the other and never accept any taboos. There has to be a, a world in the 21st century where we have to look beyond our plates and never ac uh, accept limitations or taboos. Thank you. I think I'm very away from business. I'm a very bad, bad business person. I'm from social sciences. But I think it concerning what we talked about migration, about Muslims, we should or you should try to get a lot of Muslim students because I think it's uh, that if a group is excluded from society and doesn't uh, identify with the country, it's very often also connected to econ economic success and looking at the, at the elections in, in Turkey, in, in Switzerland or other countries where the Turkish community is more successful and comes from different countries in, in Turkey, they didn't vote and the majority didn't vote for, for Erdogan. And I think it's really important to, to get uh, this, this group to universities. We, we also have hardly any Turkish students, so there are no role models. And, and I think econom ec economy is very important also in analyzing anti-Semitism. It's not the only uh, fact, but we, we have definitely more, put more emphasis on it. Thank you very much. Oh boy, that, that's very difficult. I thought we made a start tonight. I thought some interesting things were said. Um, this is a subject, so respect, no taboos, 100% agree. Get more, widen the circle. Um, and um, 
It requires a great deal of honesty. It requires a great deal of self-reflection. It requires a great refusal of silence, refusal of um, a kind of correctness, a correct silence which mm -hmm. descends in the classroom. There's too much of that in our classrooms, too much of it in my classrooms. We have to talk to each other. And we, we have to talk to each other about some rather difficult, embarrassing and difficult subjects. And we just got to do it. And we do it, and we do it, and we do it, and we keep going, keep going, keep going. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the, uh, my personal icons in org theory uh, always says, uh, progress is made uh, if, you are still, uh, if you are still confused, but on a higher level. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the, uh, uh, the, this evening might have contributed uh, to that. Uh, so if you're feeling still confused, no worries. Uh, if you're still confused on the same level, hmm, uh, not sure, but maybe on a slightly higher level. Uh, anyway, I think it uh, was, uh, at least for me, a very, very good starting point. Uh, my thanks go, uh, first of all, uh, to the members of the panel, uh, especially to you, uh, Professor Ignatiev, uh, uh, but also to our other two panelists uh, for kind of being available, sharing your insight uh, and uh, uh, discussing the things here. Uh, my thanks go uh, to VU and uh, uh, to the Rectorate for kind of offering uh, this uh, uh, opportunity for the department uh, to kind of uh, bring forward uh, one of their uh, uh, topics and also to the colleagues in the department who uh, entrusted us, uh, Michael and myself, uh, 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 and also in the background our initiative, uh, uh, Antisemitism at Work, with this uh, thing. And my thanks uh, go to you uh, for uh, making yourself available and uh, kind of participating here in this uh, event. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the floor is yours if you turn around. Uh, so not here, the floor is yours over there. And uh, there is a lot of uh, opportunity of uh, uh, kind of still having some conversation. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks once again.